All right, we are recording. Welcome to the second webinar in the Angel Accelerator series. Uh, and I'm going to flip over to the slides. Oh, I'm going to share screen and flip over to the slides. Uh, is All right, so this is the Frontier Angel Accelerator, webinar number two. Uh, my name is Looney. I am the founder of Fledge, and I'm here with my co-host, John Seacrest. Um, I'll let him speak in a minute here. So standard housekeeping to start. Uh, please put yourself on mute if you're not speaking, but we do, in fact, want you to come off of mute and speak whenever you feel like it. Uh, I can't. Whoever's speaking can't see the, the chat window, so the other person will try and, and chime in if you want to speak via chat, but please do unmute yourself and, and chat whenever you want. Uh, gallery view is great, except when we're presenting slides, which we're going to do for most of today, so that's, that's useless. Um, and again, put in questions in the chat window at any time you feel like. Uh, we do want this to be as interactive as possible, uh, but this one is um, uh, more of a lecture. Uh, and we are recording this for all the people who can't, can't make it, so thank you if you're watching on the recording. All right, five things we're going to do tonight. Uh, we're going to do a quick recap of what we said last week. Uh, open it up to questions. If anyone had any questions, or two weeks ago, I guess. If anyone had any questions lingering from those two weeks. Uh, and then John's going to present a topic that will be part of the curriculum that we provide to whoever wants to run this, which is Angel Investing 101. Uh, then I'm going to follow with a different topic, which is, again, going to be part of the curriculum we provide, which is Fund Management 101. Uh, we'll take questions again during those is fine. We'll stop at the end if you if you want to wait to the end to see if we covered it uh, And then we'll just do general Q&A for the week All right So with that recapping last week or last time uh, We talked about two different formats So John talked about the Seattle Angel Conference and the Oregon Angel Conference and the the other angel conferences that are getting spun up uh, this is a session, a, a style of programming that's run 15 times in Seattle in the last seven plus years. Uh, and the way it works is you find a bunch of angels. So the target here in Seattle is 40 angels. Uh, and each of them, again, these numbers we expect to vary from city to city, but here in Seattle, they each chip in $5,500. $5,000 of that goes to investment pool. $500 is the cost of running this, this system. Um, it's mostly really the back end cost of running the system and very little, very little of the money to run the actual program. Uh, so 40 times 5,000 is a $200,000 budget. You then recruit a bunch of, comp of companies to come in and compete for that $200,000. And the angels that you bring in are then learning how to be angels by being angels. They're learning how to be angels by talking to these companies, figuring out which ones are worthy to go on to the next round. There's a few rounds in this system. Uh, finally, the angels pick six of those companies as a group to move forward to go to the finals. Uh, it's a 12 week long program when done here in Seattle in terms of 12 weeks of due diligence with the companies. Those final six companies get up on stage. We have a big event, 200 people show up at that event. Uh, they pay money to watch these companies pitch. Companies pitch, the investors go away for an hour or so, they pick one company, that company wins the $200,000 investment. If the, inv if the angels feel like investing in more of those six companies, they are totally, uh, totally allowed to invest in as many as they want. And these days it tends to be two. Uh, so again, that, that program has run 15 times, it's highly successful. And John can unmute and tell you how many how many alumni there are, because I always forget. So we have 350 uh, investors who've gone through the program, and we've uh, invested in um, 31 companies now, as of Friday last week. Um, and now we have um, uh, the 15th round is currently underway, and uh, we have 2.8 million that's been deployed this way. So this is working. This is a totally, um, a totally fine system that every city should be running, right? And if you want to bring it to your city at the end of these webinars, you can raise your hand and we'll teach you how to do that. And we'll give you all the tools to do that. Or we also talked about a second program, which has never run anywhere to, to our knowledge, uh, which is the angel accelerator model, which is targeted toward getting enough angels together 
in order to run a business accelerator. Uh, and the difference again, there being a business accelerator inviting in a cohort of companies where everyone gets an investment. So the straw man that I put on the table in Seattle, which I have not run yet, is $11,000 per investor, 25 investors. That gets a budget of $250,000 and a 25,000 uh, pool of capital to run this program for the angels. Um, and we actually run Pledge for about $250,000 when we run it in, in all our different cities. That's enough to give each team 20,000 US dollars and pay for all the expenses for running it uh, in a city the, the size and expense of Seattle. Uh, the difference being the timing of this program is different than the Angel Conference. Uh, one thing we have not yet settled on is how long it takes for the Angels to pick the startups, but the Angels would pick the startups to come into the accelerator. And then during the program, they would be taught a curriculum on how to be uh, lead investors and portfolio managers and kind of angel investing 201, assuming that these people would understand, would have either gone through the conference or understand a little bit about angel investing already. If they haven't, then they'll be taught angel investing 101. And the expectation is that since there are six, seven, eight, ten companies that they've picked themselves, that they'll want to continue working with one or two teams over the course of the accelerator and that upon graduation they'll want to then help those graduates they'll, they'll want to help that one or two team that they pick they want to help them raise money and so that gets the the goal of this is to help take that weight off the shoulders of the people running the accelerators that they're in charge of all the follow-on capital and put some of that weight on the shoulders of the angels and the investors of the accelerator while also creating a, uh, in both cases, creating a community of angels who then like your organization, who, who want to help your organization and put more money into, into things that you're doing so that you have an easier time raising money to go do your next session. So that's the, the quick recap from last week. And I'll stop there for a second to see if anyone has any questions. And if not, I'm pulling up the chat window so I can kind of see it. It's off the edge of my screen. Okay, if not, then I'm going to hand off the mic to John and he's going to walk us through Angel Investing 101. So thanks very much. Um, this is essentially a workshop. So when we run the angel conference, while it has a 12 week due diligence processing with the companies, we run eight workshops ahead of time, both as a mechanism for um, getting a vocabulary into the investors uh, discussions, but also as a way of attracting new companies and attracting new investors to the process. So we use it essentially for um, marketing our program. Um, this class is sort of the introduction to the notion of it in the Seattle context. I'm assuming that we will have a bunch of uh, shifts that would have to happen in another co uh, community in order to adapt it correctly to that community. Um, but uh, this is Seattle US centric that we're going to go through. So let's go quickly through this. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why we angel invest, but go through a couple of definitions. Um, look at what angel investing looks like in Seattle, talk about what portfolios look like and what it looks like to evaluate companies and then we'll go on. So next, so why do we invest in angel investing? Well, let's sort of start with what we mean by angel investing. So next to one more. So an angel investor is someone who's using your own money to do investment in a startup. And so that's, Typically under in the in the US model, it's either a preferred note or, or a preferred equity or a convertible note and that can range from a safe on one side to uh, Some series a preferred terms on the other. So there's a wide range of terms from inside the angel space and there are other terms that um, could be added to make that even wider, but the, the key here is that they're uh, individuals who are investing their own money. And uh, there's the magic word accredited that makes a difference in the United States. So next. 
Yeah, and before, before we jump forward, um, you know, things like terms, we will have that in the curriculum as well. We just don't have, there, there isn't, this will be, the whole curriculum of teaching, investing, and, and getting that um, vocabulary down, that takes, you know, eight, nine, ten weeks in the accelerator, sorry, in the angel conference. Uh, so we can't cover that in four weeks of, of uh, webinars. We're just giving you a taste. So we want to distinguish those that are angel investors from those that are good angel investors and talk about um, those investors that take the time to figure out what the compute, what the company is doing and understand clearly whether this is a good company or not. And so um, we know that there are some people who invest uh, quickly based on some impulse that they find interesting. And we want to try to help people be a little bit more data driven and and be more thoughtful about their angel investing and do a good job to build a good portfolio that works for them. So next slide. So in the United States, we have this magic line that says, if you're accredited, then you can invest in unregistered stocks. Um, if you're not accredited, you are limited to uh, buying registered stocks. And the, the accredited is you have to have 200,000 in income each year or 300,000 with your spouse, or you can have a million dollars not counting the primary residence, or you can be an entity, a trust being one of those entities, but it can be nonprofits as well that have assets over um, 5 million. Um, and this, this allows you to be an accredited investor writing checks to unregistered companies. Um, the interesting thing is that um, being accredited doesn't mean that large numbers of people are doing it. So only about 1% of the people in the United States who are accredited actually write checks and about 10% of the population is accredited. So what we would like to find out in each of the contexts that this gets picked up is um, what kinds of wealth are possible? What's the mechanism by which people can write checks and who are those people in the community that might be able to afford to make that kind of uh, investment with some kind of risk. And so we'll, we'll need to understand each context before we dive into what the right audience to attract as investors is. Next. Um, we want to distinguish uh, a startup from a small business. Usually when we're doing angel investing in the Seattle context, we're looking for gross companies companies that will have some mechanism to get big and hit scale. And therefore, out of that process, we'll see a high multiple on the company. So that means um, when we invest, um, we're investing in companies that are relatively risky. And that risk gets covered by the fact that some of them pay off. And we'll talk about that process. Um, a small business, on the other hand, is a business that does not plan to grow and be very big or in this case they're talking about a liquidation event liquidation in the united states is typically you do an ipo which is that you sell your stocks on the public market or you get acquired by some other company and so those are the two pathways 95 percent are currently acquisitions by some other company um, so if you're a small business uh you're running along just fine with a high margin, um, but you don't plan on having exponential growth, then in the Seattle context, they typically are not interested in that kind of company. Um, and then back to this deal terms, we're doing uh, an angel investment in, or an angel conference in Anchorage, Alaska. And Anchorage has quite a different uh, uh, company mix than what we see in Seattle. And so they are looking at a different set of deal terms, one that uh, Looney has used called uh, revenue redemption as a mechanism by which they might expand to a broader set of companies. And so uh, another time there might be a good, good discussion about revenue redemption as a mechanism for um, driving the process of deal terms that approach uh, companies that have margin, but not perhaps exponential growth. Next. So we also, uh, when we talk about venture investing, everybody jumps to venture capitalists. One of the things that happens with venture capitalists is venture capitalists are professionals that run a fund that spend other people's money. And so they're making money off of the fees 
and the profits of the investment rather than spending their own money. So they have a very different view. And since they're trying to be paid for doing this work where angel investors are typically uh, doing the work themselves, um, that means that they need to have relatively large funds so that they can take an appropriate fee so that they can pay their salaries. So venture capital typically is taking a 2% per year fee and they're usually taking a 20% um, profit uh, carry on the uh, deals. And so to do that, they wanna be in the you know, 10 million to 50 million range for doing seed level uh, stuff and maybe um, much, much bigger if you're going on to later stages. Um, almost all of the the work that uh, venture capitalist is doing is aimed at the few huge exits. And so there's this ongoing conversation about unicorns and the possibility of being over a billion dollar company. That, that uh, is one possible pathway for how to think about uh, startups from an uh, angel investor point of view. We usually have maybe 20, 25% of our angel investors are coming into our program sort of believe in the unicorn, get big and then make money kind of um, story. Rob Wilbank calls this the earner versus the burner um, idea. Um, however, um, angels investing their own money, venture capitalists investing uh, other people's money generally means that the angels tend to be at the early stages, venture capital tends to be at the later stages. And, and a lot of angel investing just assumes there will be venture capitalists later. And so so one thing missing from here is just, and, and um, uh, missing from this slide and some others in the future is just this idea of how much, comp how much money will this company need that you're looking at in total? And where's that money going to come from? And so is, it's not just is this next investment the right investment at the right price, at the right team and all that but is there gonna be another round or another two rounds or another three rounds and where on earth is that money gonna come from? And specifically when you have a convertible note, a convertible note assumes the next round is going to happen. So if you invest with a convertible note and that round never happens and you have no mechanism of closing that note because of the fact that there's no exit, um, you can uh, move from being an angel investor to being a philanthropist. <laughs> Um, so let's look a little bit about how angel investing works, right? So angel investors in the United States are writing, you know, about $21 billion in the United States on a yearly basis into about 64,000 companies. Um, and that's been relatively steady um, for a, lo a long time, for several years. Uh, venture capitalists have invested um, 84, and this is, I think, the 2017 number, 84 billion in about 8,000. So that's a much smaller number of companies and much larger checks that they're writing. Um, but you see that at the seed stage, they're about equivalent to what the um, angels are doing, but they're writing again, even in the seed stage, they're writing bigger checks. And, and uh, they write about 4,000 checks to new companies each year. So this right. is they about 4,000 checks to the, fir the first time they write to a company and then the VCs are expecting to write at least three checks to these companies. So it's 8,000 right. total, but about half of those are second and third checks. And angel investors typically are not investing the second time they're expecting someone else to be doing that. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in my part as well. And so when you look at the United States, the HALO report sort of collects data on this. Uh, we get that from the Angel Resource Institute. There's also another group, the American Angel, that's trying to collect data. Um, and we see that we're getting uh, investments from all over the country in different ways. So it's not that everything is in the Bay Area. There actually is a wide range of places where people are writing checks. So it would be interesting to find out in each of the communities that's considering putting an angel um, conference together what kinds of activities are happening in your neighborhoods, uh, who's doing what kinds of things. Um, I always find it interesting that California, which is about the size of um, Japan with the 11th largest economy in the world, uh, is all added together and then we call that the Bay Area and yet there's many other parts of uh, California. 
So the Bay Area actually is less than 30% of the total amount of checks that are written. Next. And so um, when we're looking around at companies, we're not taking you know, every other company and investing. We're looking at uh, bundles of companies. Typically of the 30 companies that present, um, we are investing in one. And so there's a lot of filtering going on. Sometimes the companies are wrong for the investor. Sometimes they're at the wrong stage. Sometimes they're simply bad companies. There's lots of choices. Um, but even when we pick that one out of 30, the, the distributions are not normal distributions. They're following a, a power curve. And we'll dig into that a lot more here. But significant numbers of them are not going to succeed at returning money to the investor. Next. And so when we look at how they got to the end of what they were doing, most of them, 50% of them went out of business. A bunch of them were acquired for one reason or another. 7% uh, of them end up uh, just being alive, not dying, not getting bigger, just being. Um, and then some of them we lost track of, and then a uh, very small percentage, 0.1% actually go on for an IPO. So the vast majority die, the next group uh, get acquired for some reason, and then some very tiny fraction ends up going public. And so why would everybody do this when it's crazy? Well, if you, if you have all of this um, behavior, what you're seeing is that the allocation of assets is not following a normal curve. That means it's not following a bell curve. And so um, there's very few that produce outsized returns. And if you're building rational portfolios, what we end up seeing is something like a 25% annualized return. And that's, that's significantly interesting. Um, you can get a good annualized return and still have 50 to 70% of your companies not returning uh, positive returns for you. And so one of the advantages of angel investing is that it's completely uncorrelated with the stock market. And in fact, maybe negatively uh, uh, correlated because um, in bad years when the stock market is doing terrible, that's a great time to invest in startups because there's additional resources available in terms of quality employees, quality resources at a low price. Um, and so this also gives you a way to build a reasonable portfolio across your whole asset class, which ends up um, giving you a little bit more control than you would if you were in the public markets with micro caps. Next. Uh, actually, I want to stop and toss in two things here. So just be clear for uh, emerging markets, that's 25% annualized return, not counting inflation. Um, so inflation is low enough in the states that we ignore it when we talk about startup investing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that makes a big difference. I've, I've talked to many, many person in many a country where the bank pays 20%. And so we're right. talking about 25% on top of that. Um, and, uh, and while you may, you know, you may have uh, not actually listened to this last slide thinking, well, I'm not an angel investor. I don't have a million dollars, right? I can't write these checks. If you're going to run one of these programs in your city, you're going to be convincing people who haven't done this before in order to be an angel investor. So the, the motivation on why angel investing makes sense, you need to be able to internalize that and, and, and teach this part back, which is um, A, why we're teaching it tonight and B, why we're going to present, uh, provide this as a curriculum. Here. And so when we, when we look at this, so the, one of the professors at Willamette University did study a large amount of um, angel investment uh, returns. Rob Wiltbank um, ended up, uh, I think, getting 15,000 data points that he looked through. And the vast majority, and in this data set, uh, it was 70% of them returned less than one X. And so um, you put in your money and the money you get back is less. In fact, most of them uh, return nothing. So you put your money in and you got uh, a nice letter at the end saying, there's no money here, go away. Um, a, sm a much larger um, a group of companies that succeeded end up being in the one to five X. They get more than the money you put in 
um, but sometimes it's just a little and sometimes it's 5x. And then you see that um, there's a little bit that are bigger than three, 30 times the money you put in. So every now and then we get these 30, 100, 200 thousand percent returns um, on, on uh, your investment. Um, but it's very, very, very small over there. But the 30x, actually the 10x and above is what the venture capitalists talk about. Um, but the angel investors are getting 30% uh, of their returns out of that one to 5x return. And so that's, that turns out to be very interesting. Typically we're seeing on average a 2.5x over the whole portfolio. Um, that's in, again in this 22 to 25 to 27, we get different data sets that are somewhere in that range. Um, and of those, um, they're usually taking four to six years to do that kind of thing. Um, but by the time you look at early pre-pre-seed investment to pre-seed to seed to series A to series B and go through the capital stack, it might end up being a total of 10 to 15 years for some companies. So you have to be uh, aware that it might take a long time. Next. So um, again, digging deeper into these returns, the blue is the number, the percentage of the exits that are in the category. And so in this, in this data set, um, just a little bit over 50% return less than one X. Um, and there's a little bit, maybe 5% of all the money returned is coming back in that category. We see in the one to five X category that 30% of the money uh, is coming back in that category um, and a little bit more than 30% of the total deals are happening in that category. And then as you, as you go on to this greater than 30X, um, we're seeing that almost 50% are in the 30X category. So very small number of companies, but those, those companies are returning most of the money. Uh, intriguingly, that 30% that's over in the 1X to 5X, there's a lot more companies that are in that. So the probability of getting one of those is a little bit higher. And so there's some, some investors that aim at that group of companies instead of aiming at the unicorn companies. And that conversation of, I can, I can make money at this, or I, can't, I, I can see how that company will make money versus I see how that company can be really big and I can make a lot. And those are two different worldviews. Um, again, back to that earners and burners point of view. And we end up with usually three or four different angel investment theses in the group as we go through this. And so part of the process is to help people discover what kinds of companies they're looking for and out of that, what kinds of exits they're anticipating. And so different people come up with different opinions about that. Next slide. So, um, this process, you know, even with that thing, if you build a rational portfolio, you can do very um, interesting work. And at the same time, um, the act of engaging with these companies and the act of going through this process can make a fundamental difference to both your local economy, but also to the state of the world. So, you know, we believe both Looney and I in this notion of impact investing is a good thing getting people to engage with their communities and make the next generation of whatever happen that makes the world a better place is interesting. But from a personal point of view, as an angel investor, you're getting to see the edge of where the market is at and you get to learn a bunch of things that otherwise you wouldn't have access to. So it's a lot of fun to do this when you do it well. So back to that building a portfolio thing. You need to be in a reasonable number of deals. Um, I believe that sort of the minimum number you should target is how are you gonna get into 20 deals? But given that this is a high risk activity, um, you should be figuring out what portion of your net worth you're going to deploy into this category, into this asset class. Um, Yoko, who put this together, suggested that 5% of your, your assets might be a reasonable number. I've decided to put 10% of my assets into this angel investing asset class. And so of that category, then if you're putting in that amount of money, you should then figure out how to divide that by at least 20 
but making 20 separate investments so that those investments have a reasonable chance of producing a return. And you should be aiming for this internal rate of return of 25% to make up for the risk of those other companies not succeeding. So next, yes. So when we look at portfolio size, we see that um, with, a, with a portfolio of five, your chances of getting to uh, getting your money back are like 50-50. Uh, and really you wanna be somewhere in the 20, 25 range to have a relatively like better than 90% chance that you will get uh, one times your money back. Um, and so um, we're looking at relatively um, big numbers of companies in order to make this work. But when you do this, you can get a portfolio that's two, three X average across all of those companies and then some people like right side capital are believing, you know, do 100, do 200, and then you get really good chance of getting uh, significantly more um, multiple on your companies. So when we say 25%, when you look at the companies, if I'm uh, running my portfolio and the companies are exiting in five years and I'm getting a return of um, 3x on my companies uh, overall, then we're gonna end up seeing something like the first column here where most of the companies, half of them return nothing, a couple of them return what I put in, one or two return uh, a little bit more than I put in, and one of them has to return 24 times the money I put in in order to make that happen. And so the probability of that with 10 is uh, slightly better than 60. And it, it, sorry, John, it took me two, two tries to figure out what this means. So this is companies, it is 10 investments, company A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So the 10 company investments. 10 company uh, A, B, C, D, and E returned nothing. F right. and G returned one, whatever you put in. H right. doubled your money, I tripled your money. J has to return 24 times your money in order to reach the goal in the five year period, given how I are working. Right. And if we end up taking longer to do that because the companies are struggling or the market is changing or whatever, then you end up having to have a 68x return instead of a 24x return. And so earlier exits give you better um, uh, returns, internal rates of return. And so um, that's just part of the process of understanding how long is it going to take for this company to get to the point where it hits the various milestones that will make it go. And if you have a company that's going to take a really long time, then it better have a really big return number on it somewhere. Next. So um, since companies are typically wanting 25,000 as their minimum investment. Um, here, here, in here in Seattle. Here in Seattle, actually everywhere in the United States. Yeah, but yeah US, and, US and Europe. Yeah. Um, I don't know about Europe. I should find out. Um, it's the same. I, I, I've been, I, I've run pledge in Europe. It's the same, 25,000 euros, 20,000. Yeah. And so um, you're gonna wanna build a portfolio that that makes sense. If you're a millionaire and you're investing in 20 deals and you're investing 10% of your net worth, that's 100,000 divided by 20 is $5,000 a piece. So the $5,000 um, of the Angel Conference actually teaches a recipe for that just barely a millionaire to be able to do this. And the answer of how to invest 25K when you're only writing a, a $5,000 check is that you have to learn how to invest as a group. And so we as an Angel Conference are teaching a recipe of how groups of people can invest together to write the 25, 50, $100,000 check so that the companies get what they need, but the investors also stay within a portfolio building methodology. But you have to figure out um, what the thesis is about which group of companies you wanna invest in. There are thousands of companies in the United States looking for funding. Um, randomly distributing it among them would not be a good answer. And so we need to figure out how to learn how to do this investment as a group investment where we do reasonable due diligence along the way. And we do that in the angel conference process. 
So one of the things that we know from, again, from Rob Wilbank's data is that investing in what you know tends to improve your outcomes. And here's the data set for that, but we can skip to the next slide. And we know that if you do a reasonable amount of due diligence, it also uh, improves your outcomes. So we want people to look at the guts of the company, look at the market, double check on uh, what the company said to you and, and understand what the reality of that business structure is. And when you do that, you can double your um, outcomes. Um, so angel investors tend to invest in different ways as groups. In Seattle, we have multiple pathways. So we have a significant number of people investing on their own. When they do that, they typically are extra wealthy and can afford to write the $25,000 to $100,000 check without um, trouble of building a reasonable portfolio. We have active angel groups like uh, Sea Change Funds, where everybody in the group does the decisions and everybody in the group builds deal flow. We have passive angel funds where um, the decision is algorithmic, where you know if Joe invests from Alliance of Angels, then we'll invest 25K into that deal. Or we can have networks where we bring all of the companies together, but then individuals decide whether they're gonna put money in. Uh, there are online syndicates like AngelList that can form groups. Um, I find that most of the time the syndicates are more um, a form of uh, passive investment where people see somebody else investing and they just go with them and don't do due diligence. And then you might have uh, programs in place that drive things like uh, Pioneer Square Labs or Madrona Labs that are building companies and then have a fund that are associated with those companies. So, oh, let me back up. Yeah. I believe that any reasonable ecosystem should be able to support all of these different um, mechanisms. So the goal of the Angel Conference, Seattle Angel Conference was to produce the Seattle Angel Fund, which is now called Sea Change Fund. Um, and that, um, fund happened because we were able to gather 60 people together who understood how to work in a group. And so all of these different mechanisms have uh, a place in the Seattle ecosystem. I believe that almost all of the um, ecosystems can uh, support this. Um, and then the question is, how do you grow the capacity of the angels to form these kinds of groups and learn about the different patterns that are there? Next. So we know from the CB Insights, they've gone through 150 companies that were angel invested and we see a bunch of reasons that the companies failed. These are angel invested in companies. So they're not the 30 that were invested in, but the one of 30 that were invested in that they thought were great deals and still most of them failed. And of the ones that failed, they typically failed because they didn't understand their market. They had a team that didn't do what they needed to do or they had a product problem. And so those are places we wanna um, dig in deep when we're doing our due diligence. On the other hand, next slide, companies succeed where they're in the right flow of the market, of where the market is going. They catch a wave in the market. They have a good strong team. That idea has some, uh, critical component that's uh, impressive by itself. Somewhere down inside that idea, there's a, a matching business model that makes sense that actually drives it. And then uh, having funding sometimes makes a difference, but a lot more infrequently than people tend to think. Um, funding is usually not the barrier to a success for a company. Typically it's uh, market and team um, sometimes it's the business model, sometimes it's the idea. Rarely, much less frequently, is it the funding and access to the funding as a mechanism for succeeding. It may be a mechanism for growing, but not necessarily for a business succeeding. And I'm, I'm gonna dwell on this one for a second. So Bill Gross is the founder of Idea Lab, which is, it's neither an accelerator nor an incubator really. It's um, it's an older it's an older model that doesn't get copied too often. It's a company factory. Uh, so yeah. they create new companies. I don't know where they source their ideas, but the ideas show up and they put a team around it and they work on that and they build companies inside the lab 
And when they feel like it's ready for the real world, they'll go out and get some more funding for it. Uh, they've been doing that for 25 years, at least yeah. maybe 30 years by now. Uh, they've produced multiple public companies, multiple billions of dollars of, of corporate value, uh, over two or 300 companies by now. Uh, and Bill Gross never talked about anything until this TED talk, which was just a few years ago. And so he finally said, it's time to like, look at the data. I have a big enough set of companies. What makes this successful company successful? And so just flip back a second. A lot of people look at what, what makes companies fail. That's been looked at over and over and over again. This was the first time I saw a really good analysis of what makes companies succeed. And where, when you ask investors what they look for, they'll say it's team, 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 team then idea and business model and opportunity size and a few other things first, but first and foremost team, Bill Gross is coming back and saying, yeah, team is important, but it's nowhere near as important as timing. And when, when you know, I've, I've been uh, doing startups for almost 30 years as well. You have almost no control over timing. Timing, timing is almost, you know, it's, it's a big factor of luck in there because by the time you get to the point, where your, where your startup is ready to succeed, where it's in the market, it has a product, it has an, a big enough staff to go and grab some opportunities. Well, by then that's two or three or four or even five years down the line. And so you had, the, the founder had to predict the future three or four or five years in the future to hit that timing just right. So there's a ton of entrepreneurs out there right now who will do blockchain anything because blockchain's new. It's in the news, it's, it's gonna be huge any day now. And maybe it will, uh, but I can't tell you whether it will be huge in uh, 2019, 2020, 2021, or 2028. Uh, and I lived this personally. Uh, my, I did my first company in 1992 because there was an article in a magazine in 1991 telling me that PCs were gonna peak and the next thing was gonna be tablet computers. And they were right. In 1991, they were right, but their timing was wrong. They thought it was going to happen in 92. There wasn't even a tablet that launched in 92. We had to wait until 1993 until we had a tablet to, to buy. Uh, but no tablets really sold until 2010. 2010 was when the iPad came out. So this magazine was wrong by 18 years. And I was wrong by 17 years. And there was no way my company was going to last 17 years waiting for the market. Um, but we were right. right? It's just a matter of timing. So uh, that's one of those factors out there that you can, as an investor, say, it looks like this might be a good timing for what they're doing. Uh, but no one can actually predict it in foresight. You can only predict it in hindsight, um, which is a shame, right? We, we basically, as you can see from all this data, no one, no matter how, and you'll see in mine as well, uh, no matter how professional you are, no, how, no matter how much due diligence you are, you do, you actually won't predict more successes than failure. You will fail more often than you succeed in investing. And the saving grace is that the winners win enough. They, they get big enough to make up for the losses. So thank you for my rant. Moving on. So uh, the things that we're going to look at at a company is that there's a market opportunity, that there's a product solution fit, um, that people are getting it and understand it, that the team is a good team, that there's evidence of traction, which in uh, my worldview is evidence of revenue and growth in revenue, um, but in other people's that might be eyeballs. Um, and then that there's a fundamental capacity of this business to execute and to drive the business model forward. And so we're going to end up doing analysis on that inside the due diligence for each of the finalist companies next. And so you as an investor need to think about what's the problem that's trying to be solved? What's the, pro the customer problem fit? How does that then translate into a market? Why is that market ready for this kind of solution? And try to get uh, some sense on whether this team is really the team to solve this problem, right? Do they have all the right pieces in the team? Do they have the experience to make it go? And then does this solution actually solve the problem, but in, in, in actuality, does the market think that this solution actually solves the problem well enough for them to engage in it? And so we want to talk to customers and see what they think.
and that's part of the due diligence. So going into the guts of this, good angels can make good money. Um, we do 2x, 2.5x. Uh, I am currently at that in my portfolio, so I know that it's true that some angels can do it if they build a portfolio. Only a small number of these turn into returns. Um, the successful ones that are really successful have high multiples. My highest multiple is 22x. Um, so th those pay for many of the other ones that are still sitting out there. Um, and so if you do reasonable due diligence, you explore the process of this and you get a reasonable number of companies inside your portfolio, the chances that you can do well. And we're trying to tell people locally in, in Seattle that they should be investing in Seattle, paying attention to the local community. And so the Angel Conference is designed not to help angel investors be investors in other communities, but designed for local investors to invest in local companies. Yes. So um, if you're doing only six companies, you're barely getting to 50-50. Um, and we would argue that you need to be in 20. Um, and all of the things that you're getting in the process of doing angel investing is pretty fuzzy information. And so probably the noise in the system is bigger than the signal that we're getting in the system. And so you can't be perfectly correct. We're relatively good at finding companies that are uh, bad, companies that have fat, fatal flaws and we're relatively poor at being able to select the winner. Um, again, from Rob Wolpank's dat data from the Angel um, Conferences in Oregon, uh, the companies that make it to the finals outperform the ones that don't make it to the finals, but the winners don't outperform the finalists. And so we can pick the losers, but we can't pick the winners. Uh, and that's the reason why we build these portfolios. And then as a community, we would like to figure out how to get groups of people to invest together so that we can fund local companies through that. Yeah. So there's some resources. We use the David uh, Rose book. Um, everything in there makes a lot of sense in terms of the structure that we're doing. There's a bunch of webinars from the Angel Capital Association. I think those are useful. Sue Preston is the person running the Sea Change Fund in Seattle. Um, and so that, that ends up being a useful conversation for us. Um, and there are others as well that we can share with people. So do we have any questions? Don't hold back. Hi, John. Hi, Ron. Okay, so um, I get a questions around uh, the the timing and the period of the disbursement of your money. So you decided to to put aside your free cash flow, and 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 you and you're saying uh, that you got to be able to divide it to at least twenty good portfolios, so then you can distribute the risk, right? So right. in terms of okay. the timing of the timing yeah. of the disbursement of the fund, how long should it be like? a year or less than a year or two years? Well, so when I'm talking in the Angel 101 context, I'm talking about individuals managing their personal portfolio. And so I'm expecting that um, they're going to do this over some reasonable amount of time. Um, so um, the Seattle Angel Fund, which is now called Sea Change Fund, um, takes $25,000 and invest that in five to six companies a year. And so a, a reasonable millionaire in the United States, that's sort of the bottom line of people that are allowed to do this, would then invest 25,000 over four years and get a portfolio that was a rational portfolio. And then if they did a good job, they'll have a gap of a couple of years that they might not invest. And then that portfolio should be returning money that would allow them to continue and do it again if they wanted to or not. This is not like I built a fund and I raised money in a fund to do it for somebody else. Um, but the uh, Seattle Angel Fund utilizes an annual fund. So each year they create a new one and then they deploy 
that over five to six companies in one year. And then those companies are from my Oregon Angel Fund experience. Those companies are taking seven to 10 years to return uh, reasonable amounts of money. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, if not, we'll take more questions on that uh, later. Let's jump in. We got a uh, half hour left. Um, we're gonna jump over to fund management 101. And so I'm gonna talk for the next bit, uh, not about being an angel investor, but being a fund manager. And so as you'll see at the end of this, uh, jump, jump to one of the conclusions is some of the graduates of the angel conference uh, did the conference a few times, felt comfortable in being an angel, and then went off and raised a fund. Uh, I did this when I started Fledge. Fledge is run as, a, as an investment fund. And so I started by going out and raising funds. And so first and foremost difference here is when we talk about fund management, we're typically talking about raising a bunch of capital uh, that's not yours, that's other people's capital. Um, in Seattle, again, the typical check size for a direct investment into a company is $25,000. The typical investment size into a fund ranges from 25 to 50,000 for a small fund or 250,000 to uh, two million dollars in a large fund. Um, if you're gonna do a fund to do an accelerator, uh, the question is what's the right check size in your, in your region? So again, my check size used to be $25,000 here in Seattle. I moved it a few years back to be 50. So no one is basically allowed into my fund unless they can write a check of $50,000. Um, started with three investors in the first year who wrote checks of about 25 or $50,000 each. Then I, I grew my fund to 10 investors in year two. So I raised about 200 and something thousand dollars from 10 investors. Uh, and here we are seven years later uh, and there are 55 investors in my fund for a total of uh, $2.5 million, which is averaging now something around $49,000 per investor. Um, and that total amount that I've raised over those years grew from almost nothing in year one to 200 and change in year two uh, to over $500,000 a year in the last two years. And, and we seem to be on track to do that again this year. Um, so one potential path that you have as organizers of your ecosystem is to skip over the angel conference and skip over the angel uh, accelerator and just jump straight to fund or to get someone who you were going to invite in to do one of those to instead start in and, and raise a fund. Now the rest of this, I'm going to go over um, you know, what the different choices are when you create a fund. So choice number one is, do the investors commit capital to the fund? Like when they sign the paperwork to join in the fund, do they have to write the check or wire the money right then and there? And so in, typically in small funds, the answer is yes. The answer is, yeah, you sign the documents, right? It's a bunch of legal work to become part, a member of the fund. And then you immediately owe the, owe the fund, whatever the check size is, 25, 50, $100,000. The alternative to that is the more typical path for the large venture capital funds, which is called callable capital. So in that form, you promise to invest a million dollars into a venture capital fund. They will call, as they say, let's say the first 20% of that. So you have to write them a check, you know, as soon as they ask for it of $200,000, and they will call the rest of the capital over the next few years. And that, that term of how often they'll call and when that is will be in the documents. And it's typically more or less 20% per year for five years, right? With, with you know, uh, investments, big investments get in the way they need to call more, they'll call more. Uh, you, know, the mar the you get a, uh, a recession or other downturn in the market, they might call less in a given year. Um, but those are the two types of ways to get the money into the fund. Second thing to think about when you're starting a fund is what does it invest in? So that's the same as running an accelerator. So what stage companies are you gonna work with? Idea stage companies, companies that have the prototype done, so that would be kind of pre-seed, you know, prototype in the market, but no paying customers would be pre-seed. Seed funding would be 
uh, either to make the prototype happen or to get the realistic number of sales. Um, these terms are, uh, are debated here in the States on what they mean. Startup capital would be where the angel conference would like them, which is we have some traction, they have some customers, they have some revenues, they're ready to grow up. And then growth, which sounds like it should be there, is usually meaning later on. Like they have a million in revenues already, they wanna to get to 10. That would be growth. They have 10 million in revenues, they wanna to get to 100 million, that would be later growth. They have 100 million, they wanna to get to a billion, that would be late stage, still growth. But, um, Growth would be, think of it best as a million in revenues. And so just thinking through that, the companies become less and less risky the further down this path that you target. And there are fewer and fewer of them. And when we start to talk about emerging markets, it, well, if you're not gonna do the pre-seed fund, who is, where's that money gonna come from? So if you think about this in terms of an ecosystem, maybe what you need to do in your, in your city, in your country, is you need to do an angel conference for the earliest stuff and an angel accelerator for the middle and then a fund to do the startup and the growth stage. That might be the answer to how you, you personally help build out the ecosystem. All right, a few more questions. Do you make as a fund only one investment in a company and then you're done or do you set aside money to make multiple investments in a company? Uh, no matter what kind of company that I've worked with and I, I work with things that John would call a, uh, not a startup. Everybody always wants more money. Um, most, it's really rare to find an entrepreneur who's satisfied with what they have, even if they're making a million dollars a year or half a million dollars a year. They usually wanna make their company bigger. Money helps them get there quicker. You know, are you going to be the, the fund that supplies them the next round of money or are you gonna wait for some other fund to do that? Uh, that's, a, that's also a debatable question. In the early stage funds in the United States, it's about a 50-50 mix on whether or not companies write one check or multiple checks. Um, for later stage, full scale venture funds, uh, it's always multiple rounds. Okay, back to questions. Uh, again, what sector are you going to uh, invest in? So is it anything, doing anything in any SDGs or are you gonna pick three? Or is it just agriculture or just FinTech or just tech uh, or just, um, uh, clean, clean energy or, or whatnot, or just food or whatnot. Uh, and where are you going to invest? Uh, and really, when, it, when you sit down with investors that have done this, whether it's an angel or a fund, they have answers to all these questions. They have figured out that I want to invest in this stage, and I'm only going to invest in my city or only in my country or only in this region. Or when we get to the impact investors, it's often, I'm not going to invest here because Seattleites are too rich. I'm only going to invest in, uh, in uh, South Asia or Latin America or Africa or, or something else. Um, so it gets to be a, a, quite a complicated set of questions just when you're sitting down to figure out what your fund's going to do. And then there's more. Uh, so if we're talking about doing a fund associated with an accelerator or a fund associated with a group of angels, is there one fund per session of the accelerator? You might be running two sessions a year, or do you do one fund per year? Uh, or maybe it's one fund that funds, that makes investments over three years or over five years. The typical style of this for accelerators is most often one fund per session. The Seattle Angel Conference does one fund per session. Uh, second most popular is one per year. The, the side, the little angel, the, sorry, the little funds that go along with the angel groups are typically one per year or one every other year. Uh, the full scale venture funds are typically 10 year long, that's their target, but they only invest for the first five. And so that we would call that a 10 year fund with a five year horizon or a five year investment period. Uh, I've been dabbling my latest version of this. I'm doing three year investment horizons because I'm trying to show uh, investors they can make money quicker. So it's one of the techniques I'm using for that. So far, so good on that end. Uh, but they, that also drops to the next question, which is, well, if you do more than, if your length of time for making investments is more than one session, do you let new investors in? Do they all have to come in before you say, let's go? 
or do you say let's go as soon as you have a minimum number of investment uh, investors to make sense and then let other investors in later uh, if you let them in later how does that work so uh, full-scale venture funds have this really complicated formula for figuring out how to catch up on fees and all this my fund is rather simple i raise money for three years we spend it for three years investors can come in whenever they want everybody owns the same thing there you if you put in a hundred thousand dollars earlier a hundred thousand dollars late and there's a million dollars in the fund you own ten percent and uh, so far my investors are fine with that i'm sure out of the 350 alumni in the Seattle angel conference 25 percent or 30 percent or 50 percent would object to that and say that's not fair and they would object in both directions, that it's not fair to go early and it's not fair to go late because there's arguments on both sides. Uh, I think it washes out and, and my 55 investors are fine with it. Okay, moving on to things you have to worry about. Hi, Olivia, sir, can I, get a, can I ask a question? Please. So, so you raise money for three years and you investing in the following three years or in, the sa in that same two years while you're raising money, you're also investing in the same time? Correct. I am. I am. Uh, I open a fund, and it raises money and makes investments for the following three years. And so, if we don't make investments when we have no money, and when new investors show up, we we turn to our list of possible investees and pick one or two and start making more investments again. Uh, and so, we grow the portfolio over three years. At the same time, we're growing the pool of capital which is not the normal way to do it, but it, I'm, that's the way I do it and it's working just fine. And it's the same way I did the, I'm on the second round of my funds. First round was four years, we raised money for four years. That started to feel a little weird to me that year four investors were coming in and um, that seemed too long, so I shrunk it to three. Just a clarifying question, Lee. why is it not normal practice? Um, it's not normal because again, most of the investors who give some thought to this would say, all right, so the first investors put their money in and they don't know anything about this portfolio. It's blank. It's, it's, a, it's a blank check, we would call it. It's a blank check fund. Um, so they don't know what their money is going to get spent on. And let's just assume that someone else is making the decisions, not the, not the investors, which is common. Uh, so they're taking the risk of... Uh, putting some money down, trusting that the deal flow will look good. We'll talk about deal flow in a bit, that the, uh, the person running this is the right person to run this. And, you know, three years later, they'll find out what their portfolio is versus the last investor to come in at the end of year three. They now can see the, nearly the entire portfolio. So they know pretty much what they're buying. They can see how many of those have failed already. They can see which ones are succeeding. Uh, and they're putting in the last bit of money that will get spent most likely on some of those companies to help them grow. So their risk is different. Their risk is way lower in terms of unknowns. Uh, and they're getting the same, the same uh, percentage ownership as the early investors. So is that fair? Well, the way I justify it is to say, well, if we didn't have the later investors, then we would have a smaller portfolio we know from what John just showed us that the smaller portfolio is likely to return less money to us. So if we allow the investors to come in and increase the size of our portfolio, especially if we allow the late investors to come in and put more money on the winners, then we'll all, make, we'll all come out better. And so the two should balance it out. And yes, it's unfair in both sides, but it's equally unfair on both sides. So let's just do that. Um, and uh, one of my mentors had a uh, complicated scheme for trying to balance the, uh, the, the risk, and we implemented that in the first fund, and nobody cared, so I took it out in the second fund. Um, and literally, nobody cared, and it was a pain to do the spreadsheet. Uh, I dropped it, and nobody complained that it disappeared. Um, all right, so moving on to things you need to worry about as a fund manager, which is also what you need to worry about a bit running the, uh, the angel accelerators, uh, what's the investment going to be? What style of investing is, is going to be made? Debt or equity or a mix, mix of both, especially if you're doing a fund, you're going to be making a bunch of investments. Do you do anything that's needed or are you strict? We only make debt investments. We only make equity investments or neither. So my fund, my fund does everything, but we try and do 
everything we can as revenue-based investing. And if you didn't see that workshop, it's in the recordings. I did that in Singapore. Um, and so there are ways to do things in between. Most funds pick one or the other. Uh, I just did an analysis of um, investors in Africa. Um, I went to the Sankalp Africa conference. We had about 45 investors tell us what they do. And in, in Africa, the answer was they do everything. It was, a, it was a very overlapping mix of debt equity and grants. And so we, we saw there half of the grantors were making investments and they were doing a mix of debt and equity. Okay, and then lastly, uh, no, actually, I think we have another slide after this. Uh, next is how long are you gonna expect to see your returns? So we saw from John's data that typically we're talking about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. You gotta remember that if you're investing for five years, let's say, uh, and then it takes 10 years to uh, harvest every last bit of result from that, that's a 15 year fund. Um, and if you're investing for three years and it takes seven to get everything back, well, that's a 10 year fund. 10 years is a long time. Um, when we're talking, when we talk about funds, when we talk about investing in startups, we're talking about taking money, right, away from rich people, but we're talking about taking money and handing it off somewhere else and not returning most of it for seven, eight, nine, 10 years. That it's like sitting in a black box, they can't have it back, completely illiquid, that's really where the risk is. The, the biggest risk that, um, that investors see is, well, I don't I have no idea what's gonna happen in the next 10 years. I might need some money in the next 10 years, which is why they only invest five-ish percent of their wealth in this kind of investing. It's just locked away for a long time. So I'm trying to shrink this down to seven by saying we're gonna invest for three years, return the bulk of it using the revenue-based structure in the next five or six or seven, and it'll probably go 10 or 12. It always goes longer. Um, okay, moving on, I got three more of these. Um, how do you pay for this fund? So this is one that a lot of fund managers get hung up on. There's a, uh, a very common style that's been going on in venture capital world for about 30 years, and we just shorten it down to two and 20. So uh, when you get pitched as, an, as, a, uh, as a rich person in the US by a fund, uh, you'll ask them, one of, the, one of the due diligence questions, if they don't tell you, you ask them, are you a two and 20 fund? And more often than not, their answer is yes. And the way you parse this is to say, the two is the management fee. And sometimes they'll say it's one and a half and 25 or one and 20 or one and 15, but usually it's two and 20. So what that means is every year, they get, they get to take out of the pool of, of um, all the capital that's been promised to the fund, not just the capital that's been called, but everything that's been promised to the fund, they take 2% of that per year to run their fund. So if it's a $100 million fund, they get, um, do the math there, they get uh, $2 million a year to run the fund. That's the cost of paying all the uh, investors, paying the, the rent in the really nice, um, really nice office space, um, flying around to board meetings, everything they're doing, they're, they're paying out of $2 million a year, which sounds lovely, and, and it is. Um, uh, except the investors don't really like to pay that fee. I don't know any investors who like the 2% the fee per year. Because 2% over a 10-year time period is 20%. So if you're taking 20% of the capital out of the fund, you're lowering the odds of returning the 25% that you're expecting to return. Uh, so you get a lot of pushback there. The other flaw with the two and 20 for small funds is if we do the same math on a million dollar fund, well, 2% then is, get that number right, a million be hundred would be $20,000, which uh, in nearly everywhere in the world I know of, that's not enough to pay the legal fees to, keep the, to get the fund off the ground and running and pay the taxes and, and everything needed. It's just not big enough. So the 2% doesn't quite work for the small funds. Okay, the 20 in two and 20 is called the carried interest. And the way that works is typically that the investors, whatever they put in, each of them individually, if they put in $100,000, then they get the first $100,000 back. Every time money comes back from one of these investments, it goes into an account and once a year or so it gets handed to investors. Uh, and so the investor gets back whatever they put in 
And then everything above that's considered profits, right? We just ignore inflation in this world. So everything past that is, is profits. And that profits is typically split 80 cents per dollar to the uh, investor and 20 cents, 20% uh, to the fund. And that's called the carry or carried interest. And so that's where, that's where the real money comes from for venture capitalists. It's the 20% it's the share of the profits. And it's typically profits after the money has been returned, but in some funds and in the emerging markets, it's probably gonna have to be this way. It's 20% on top of something else, which we would call the hurdle. Um, so a lot of the like real estate funds will return uh, 8% um, as a, in 8 annually on whatever you put in, the, you get back your money plus that 8% compounded until you share profits with the fund managers. And so in the emerging markets where there's a known uh, inflation rate, you may have to set your hurdle at that rate, or you may have to set it, say in your paperwork, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna add that into the, we're gonna create a hurdle based on whatever the inflation actually was. That way you keep them, you keep them whole. Um, in terms of getting rid of the 2% management fee, uh, the way I do that in the fledge fund is I don't charge anything to the investors. I have a zero 20 fund to the investors. I charge everything that it costs me to run my fund to the entrepreneurs. So when I make an investment in the accelerator of $20,000 in cash to an entrepreneur, to a startup, I'm actually telling them to know it's a $37,000 investment. The other 17 is the cost of running the program. Um, and so I get, to, I get to take all the costs of running my whole fund and basically charge it to the entrepreneurs instead of the investors. And the entrepreneurs are not complaining about this to me. And the investors are very happy that they're not paying fees. Um, and I can get away with that because I'm running an accelerator and the entrepreneurs can see the value. I've never seen a venture capitalist get away with this because it doesn't look like they're doing any work. Like the entrepreneurs are not, are not feeling that the venture capitalists should be um, paid for doing due diligence on this company because the entrepreneur knows that their company is great um, and should be invested in anyway. Uh, so uh, there are other ways of trying to lower that fee and deal with it. Um, I like the accelerator model for, for having an out on this two and 20 model. Okay, last two things to think about, uh, who makes the decisions? So John mentioned the seed change fund, every investor is involved in making the decisions. We would call that an investment committee. Who's the investment committee? So is it everybody who's in the fund? Is it a subset of the investors? Is it a certain number of them or is it whoever wants to be in the investment committee? Um, not every investor actually wants to do this work. One of the benefits of doing a fund is it allows you to take money from investors who just don't want to do the work, who want someone else to do the work. And so you can do that for them or you can get a group of investors who do want to you know, pull up their sleeves and get, in, get into the dirt. You can ask them to join your investment committee or uh, you can set it up so that you get final say and they can advise you, but they don't actually get to pick. Um, and so all those are possible and I've seen all different models. In the full scale venture model, it's the partners. The, the, I'll talk about this in a second, but um, the founders of the fund, the people who run the fund are the ones who make the decisions and the investors have no say whatsoever. Okay? And then the last thing on here is anything else you can think of in terms of these funds. Uh, there aren't too many other options that I've seen out there, but one of them is, especially on a new fund, how can you make a change? If you suddenly find in year two that you need to change something in order to grab an opportunity, such as you said it was just equity, but somebody needs some debt. How do you make that change to allow debt to be made? Or the other way around, it was debt, but you have an opportunity to come in on a company that's doing exceedingly well and make an equity investment. How do you make that change? Or how do you make the change to investment committee? How do you make the change to, um, to the other choices, typically not changing the two and 20 model, right? not changing your fee structure. That, that, that would be, a, that'd be a, a taboo area to try and change. Okay, moving off from that, then the question is, how do you create one of these? And so we asked this of, of you guys last week, or last time, 
is what's the corporate structure that's used in your country to create something that's a fund? Uh, we gave you that as homework and it's still homework. You're going to have to figure that part out because this is still a structure that we use in the angel conference. So the typical way it's done for a large fund in the United States is called a limited partnership. A limited partnership is legally a partnership. Partnership is a, a, a style of corporation with partners instead of shareholders. And specifically in, this, in the case of venture capital funds, there's typically two types of partners. There are general partners. Those are the people who run the fund. Those are the managers of the fund. And limited partners, those are the investors. And typically the general partners are not also putting their money in or they're putting almost none of their, none of their own money in. Um, but they're split into two parts. The general partners are basically liable for running this fund. They're like the management in a corporation. And the limited partners, they're limited as in limited liability and they have no say. Um, smaller funds like my funds run instead as a corporate form that's called a limited liability company which is different than the common law limited uh, share company and, and, and limited LTD company. This is really a corporation that is more or less the same as a partnership. It's a very flexible structure that got created here in the States in the eighties. It has moved over to Europe. Um, I haven't seen it in Africa. I, I haven't seen it in most of the uh, developing world yet. Um, but it lets us do pretty much anything we want. And so we make it look like a partnership. It gets taxed like a partnership. Taxes is an important thing, I'll get to in a second. Um, and it's a lighter weight structure that costs us less to set up. So my funds, and I run many, many funds besides this pledge, they're all limited liability companies. The third choice is generally what we call a holding company. And that would be a company, an operating company, a, a limited, limited share company that run, it owns other companies, that invests in other companies as its operations. And the reason why we would not do that in the United States is taxes. They're really the only reason we don't do that is taxes. And so in the first two cases, in the, in the limited partnership case, in the, and we call it an LLC case, we can get taxed like a partnership, which means that all the taxes for that, that business flow through to the owners, flow through to the investors, and they pay the gains themselves, and they, pay the, and they get the losses themselves on their own personal tax returns and the corporation pays nothing in taxes. And so the profits are not taxed twice. They're not taxed as corporate profits and then handed to the individuals who then pay again. And that's really the only reason why we do it um, the way we do it here. Uh, if we set up a company as a holding company, it would have to pay down to like 20% corporate tax, but it would have to pay 20% on its profits. And then the individuals would have to pay another 30 something percent on top of that. All right, so we've got all the way to the case where you got a fund, you figured out what it does, you figure out how to incorporate it, now you gotta operate it. And first and foremost, when we talk about operating funds is where's the deal flow come from? So how do you source investees? And sourcing investees is slightly different than sourcing applicants to an incubator or an accelerator where you're not investing. So as John said in his piece, you got to look at about 30 companies before you pick one as an angel. At Fledge, we look at about 400 to pick seven. So we're a lot pickier. And at the bigger venture capital funds, they look at about 1,000 to pick one. Um, and so in order to find the winners, because you're going to put money on the line in a fund, you got to look at a lot more companies. You have, to, you have to be able to find hundreds of choices for each investment you make. Um, and then you have to figure out once you're dealing with 200 or 300 or 400 or 1,000 applicants, and they'll come if you're investing in them. The, the, they'll, there's more companies out there than you know of as soon as you say you're writing checks. So how are you going to get that down to a small number that your investment committee can, can pick from? And so dealing with that is, is, a, is, is a lot of work. Uh, the way you deal with it is just what we call due diligence. So um, who does the due diligence? If you're creating a fund out of angel investors, can you have them do it? Even if they're not doing the final say, can they do the first say? Can they help you screen and get down to a short list based on their interests? Um, how deep do you need to go on each of these due, due diligence? So we saw a couple of charts and we, we skimmed past that pretty quickly. 
Uh, and one of them showed that when you do, I think it was 20 hours of due diligence, your odds go up by, by factor two. Do you do 100 hours of due diligence? If you have enough angels, do you have them you know, keep looking down this rabbit hole until you can find whether or not this company is, is more investable? Is, is there a, there's no bottom to this hole. You could keep doing it for, for months. Well, but there, there is a bottom to this hole because there is definitely diminishing returns on due diligence. And the default answer when you do due diligence too far is no. And so yeah. it's a great, great way to do more and more due diligence and make fewer and fewer investments. Yeah. And one thing I like about running a fun, an accelerator that invests is we do some due diligence to figure out who gets in. And then I always think about the next 10 weeks or two months in the program. That's two months of due diligence on a daily basis. And that's way more than any investor would ever do. And so by the time they come out of the program, we know them, you know, like as if we created them from scratch. Because we basically tear them apart and put them together from scratch. Okay, uh, last few things here. Um, who sets the terms? So the norm in the world of angel investing is the company sets the terms. Very few angels push back and negotiate those. They'll either be in or out based on terms and whether they like the company. And a fund will typically uh, negotiate the terms, if not set them themselves. And a full-scale venture capital fund will, invest, will set the terms. They send out term sheets. Uh, and so you got to figure out whether you're going to do that. And then are you going to invest? Are you going to be the only investor as the fund or, or are there other funds? And if so, are you always going to invest in groups? And the norm in California venture capital is one, one VC will say yes, and they will write half the check. They will write the term sheet and say, we will take half the deal and we'll introduce you to other funds to do the other half of the deal. And that is not the norm in seed funds, and it's not the norm I've found over in Africa. Um, but it is, crazy enough, the, the norm that comes from the old days of, of, of venture capital in California, and it has a lot of uses, and I'm not going to explain um, too much about that, but just a little bit. Um, so investing in pairs helps you get some other questions you may not have thought of as you do the due diligence, and helps you do half as much due diligence or maybe a third less due diligence because someone else is doing it with you. Overall, if you ask them why they do it, they say it's to share the risk. Um, and it's not quite true. It actually comes back from the days when they didn't have enough money to write the check themselves. Uh, so they had to do a syndicate, which may be true of your funds. Uh, but if you go the other route and you say, no, 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 I'm going to invest myself. Well, then you get first, you get more control. You get to set the terms because you'll definitely negotiate that. Uh, you'll probably sit on the board. Uh, it means you get the first look whenever they're raising more money. And, you know, uh, I've, I've worked with, with almost 100 companies now. They will always ask me for money first before they bother to go out and, and even think about asking other investors. In fact, they'll usually ask me for money before they even have the pitch deck done. And my response, no matter what they say, is great. Send me the pitch deck. Send, send me your latest uh, update. Um, and if you're investing alone, and you're making all the checks, you're writing all the checks, you can invest in the winners again. You should get bigger rewards, but I haven't seen any stats on that. And the big question for your cities and your countries is do you have a choice on whether you invest alone or not? And that choice is basically, are there any other funds that like the same, you know, go back to the first slide, do you like that like the same stage and like the same geography and like the same everything as you? And if not, well, then you're gonna invest alone. Okay, uh, once you've decided to invest, are you gonna take a board seat? And there's a bunch of different answers to that. For an accelerator, the answer is no, because you just it doesn't scale up. For a seed fund, the answer might be, yeah, now I'll do the, I'll be, sit on the board, I'll help them set up a board, and I'll expect to get out as soon as the next investor, the bigger investor comes along. Or the answer might be that, yeah, I'm gonna invest, I'm always gonna take a board seat, in order to scale that up, I'm going to ask one of my investors to take that board seat for me. Because the uh, uh, last question on here is how many boards can you sit on? The answer is really around six. A single human being who is being an investor can handle being on six boards if they do a half-assed job, right? Three or four is a, is a real answer, but uh, VCs tend to do six. Um, uh, my mentor done, has done as many as 12. Uh, which is way too many. 
And you're going to have to expect, if you're going to go down this path of doing boards of directors, you're going to be teaching how to run a board of directors because it's not a commonly uh, understood skill. And so uh, when the VC, the full scale California VCs show up, they teach you how to, they teach you what to do if, if you haven't done it before. Okay, so what does all this have to do with this accelerator we're talking about? Well, we talked in, in Singapore about how to do a sustainable business model for an accelerator. And if you're running a fund and it's an annual fund or triannual fund or whatever, you now have a sustainable business model. You are a venture capital fund. And if you're gonna run the angel accelerator in either form or any form like it, you're gonna to have to have a fund. Or you're gonna to have to figure out how all these 40 or 50 or 100 angels can invest directly into each of the companies. And then you're gonna charge them a fee for setting this all up for them and you're really running a fund without the fund structure. All right, so do you wanna raise a fund? Big questions come down to besides do you wanna run an accelerator? Do you want to raise the fund or do you want to find someone to raise the fund? Uh, or do you actually not want to raise a fund as much as you're trying to build a community, in which case you may have to ha help set up a bunch of funds. Maybe this year you do the seed fund and in three years you do the next stage fund and then three years you do the next stage fund to try and build out the whole ecosystem. And so, here I am, uh, I came to Seattle in 1992 before pretty much all of this existed. Uh, none of, nothing on this board existed when I was here in 92. I think Alliance of Angels, maybe, maybe. You're on mute, John. Um, but uh, I think Madrona started in 93 or 94. Um, and yeah, so- uh, Alliance of Angels and Puget Sound Venture Club were- Oh, Puget Sound uh, Venture Club, so that's right. I didn't, I didn't get their logo because they don't have a fund. So here's what funds, you know, just a snippet of funds in Seattle. Uh, and um, I didn't, we didn't say it this week. Uh, Seattle does not have enough capital for our investor, our invest, uh, our startups. So we have, we are a net importer of capital from California, uh, despite the fact that we have Microsoft and Amazon and Starbucks and a whole bunch of public companies. So even we struggle with this problem. But this is more or less what it looks like. We have a few large full-scale venture funds, two of them in tech. Uh, Madrona is the biggest. Voyager is a, a distant second. Uh, Madrona's on fund six or seven now? I don't remember. I, I thought it was eight. Eight? Okay. So they have eight funds. Every three years they raise a new fund, more or less. Each of them is about two or $300 million. Um, they're all two and 20 funds. They all last 10 years in theory. They all invest for five years. They're, they're what I would call full scale venture funds. Voyager's on fund three or four. Uh, they got started in 98 because I got the first check from them in, in my one of my startups. Um, so that's the typical fund and they're being in, their investors are not angels. Their investors are pension funds, university endowments, super high net worth individuals. Um, and if you wanted to be in their fund, they don't want to in anymore. They're, they're happy with their investors. Uh, the next level down also doesn't want you. They're what I would call evergreen family funds. So Trilogy Equity Partners is six guys who made money together with a mobile phone company or two, uh, headed up by a billionaire. So he and his friends invest. It looks like a venture fund. It's run just like a venture fund, but it's just six guys' money. Uh, Bezos Expositions is just one guy's money. It's Jeff Bezos. It's his fund money on the side in, in a form where he has people who look like general partners, but they're just paid employees. Uh, same with Laird Norton, that's the Weyerhaeuser family. They have a pile of money that they invest in startups. Uh, and it's evergreen as in, it doesn't have a timeline. It's kind of like a giant angel. They invest whenever they feel like it, whenever they get returns, they just put it back in the fund. Nobody on this list actually needs any money. So they just do for the, for the um, mostly for the fun of it and to grow the size of their, of their asset base. Then the next level down are mostly new. Founders Co-op is now eight years old, I think, eight, nine years old. Uh, the rest of them are, are brand new. In fact, that's the sea change, sea, change, sea change Fund that came out of the Seattle Angel Conference. Flying Fish Fund came out of the Seattle Angel Conference. Uh, there's, a few, there's at least one more that, that somebody just emailed me that's coming out. Grub Stakes. Grub Stakes. Um, 
some of the angels in town are starting these as well. They tend to start out really small. Founders Co-op first fund was two and a half million dollars, which for Seattle, small compared to $300 million of Padrona. Um, Flying Fish is like 10, if I remember that right. No, um, no, they're 27. 27, awesome. Uh, and, um, and so these little seed funds are popping up. They're acting like big angels. Like how they act in the community is like a big angel, but they are run with other people's money like a venture capital fund. So they're doing earlier stage investment than Madrona and Voyager. And kind of alongside them are what we'd call sidecar funds. So we have a whole bunch of angel groups in Seattle, more than we need, um, or more than we should have, I should say. Uh, and most of them have a fund or two that they operate inside their angel group. So Alliance of Angels has two, uh, E8 Angels has one, and what this will do is write more another twenty-five or fifty thousand dollar check to companies that the angels inside the group like, or in the case of E8, they they actually let non-members come into their fund. So they run a little million, two million dollar fund, right? With you know, again, mostly twenty-five thousand dollar checks. Um, so what would that be like? Forty, fifty angels um, create a little pool of a million dollars, spend it for two years, and that's a technique that helps to get to 20 investors the 20 investments so if you are a, a millionaire and you hand twenty five thousand dollars to c change flying fish or e8's fund or probably 50 or 100 to founders co-op they will take that money pool it together and they'll make 10 or 15 investments right six to 15 investments which means in three or four or five years you now have 20 something investments so you're done you have that fund and if you do it with a group like Flying Fish or Founders Co-op, you don't have to make any decisions. So you get the fun of angel investing without any of the work of angel investing. And they'll tell you about these companies and you can, those companies will be happy to talk to you as if you were a direct investor. Um, but in fact, you get to do this with a whole lot less work. And I say this, it sounds, it sounds a little cheeky. Half of the investors I talk to trying to get money into my fund I have no desire whatsoever to be an angel investor and make direct deals. And half the people I want in my fund don't want to be in the fund because they only want to make direct deals. They want to make all the decisions themselves. So it's split more or less 50-50, maybe it's 60-40 one way or the other on uh, rich people who want control and rich people who want the fund without the control. And uh, we're a little over time, but do we have any questions on that or anything we've covered today? William is saying something in comments. Okay, pull that up. Okay, so William asks, uh, do, you, do you see more of a niche sector fund? And how do you see this compared to agnostic ones? So most of the funds have a sector and a geography. Uh, and often it's three sectors, three topics. Uh, and the geography is most often uh, local. Uh, that topic could be, in the case of Founders Co-op, that topic is tech. And in the case of Flying Fish, it's tech and, and something. Software. Else. No, it's just software. It's just software. All right. Uh, in the case of some other funds, it's just women. And they don't care where the women are or what the women are doing, but it has to be a company run by women. Uh, E8 calls themselves a clean tech angel group. Clean tech being a very broad definition. Uh, but they'll only invest in things that... that fall into their definition of clean tech. Um, the agnostic funds are the ones that are hardest to raise money for. And so Seattle Angel Conference, that's blind. They put the money in because they don't know what the companies are. Um, in Fledge, they know they're going to be impactful companies, but they don't know where in the world they're going to be or what they do. Um, but we promise that it's impactful. So that's one filter. But beyond that, we don't, we don't, uh, we don't do subsectors. And again, when I go out and talk to investors, and I've, at this point, talked to at least a thousand investors, um, many of them will not invest in an agnostic fund. They will simply say, no, that's not what I care about. What I care about is either we can go to, what I care about is high growth 10X returns or 100X returns, or the other end is what I care about is sanitation and water. And I don't want to invest in anything else. And there's funds out there that only invest in fish and and funds out there that only invest in fintech or ag tech or food. 
uh, or only in three countries in this part of the world and so forth. Um, and there's, they're usually pretty picky because investors are usually pretty picky. So the Oregon uh, Angel Fund and the Seattle Angel Fund, now Sea Change Fund, are sector agnostic. And they don't have necessarily problems raising funds, um, but they have a very specific active angel thesis. And so it's the process that draws people in. I think uh, the 50-50 split you're seeing of, I want to be active and I want to make all my own decisions or I don't want to be active, but I want you to do the right thing um, are a different group than the group that ends up in the C, C yeah. change fund. And it could be that the, um, that in terms of the conference that they're really coming in because they want the learning. Oh, uh, that's for sure. And the so conference. they're coming in and they want the learning on how to be an angel investor. And then once they figured out what they like, you know, and again, John talked about the split between uh, go big or go home and I like to make money. Like I like to earn revenues, right? That's a big split. And then they might find a subsector underneath that, which is I just like tech or I just like impact or I just like food. Um, so and I keep no. bringing food because I hang out with a crowd that really likes food. They like to invest in food. Uh, yeah. Everybody eats. Okay. So um, all all they, nine of the angel conferences or angel groups in Seattle have alumni from us so they you know have moved to where they like but i would argue that nine is not enough for seattle we have several segments that ought to be getting more money like our med tech is way underfunded and so um i think we would have more angel groups to start that thing off a little bit faster yeah and for some reason angel groups kind of cluster around 40 to 60 people so you know ideally in seattle i keep arguing about the fact we have too many angel groups. If we had 20 more, that would actually be a good thing, right, in the end, if they could learn how to work together, which, which they're working on. Okay, so um, is that Min asked, um, uh, they said, KISS Startup intends to conduct an investor conference, um, but before that, within four months, they want to have an investor summit as pre preparation for the conference. Uh, any advice? Um, Yes, but we're running late, so let's do that um, offline. So we'll just take one of our one-on-one -on -one sessions we we're going to do in August, and we'll just do that with you guys. Um, and so we'll do that. Uh, we'll 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 get in touch with you. You'll get our our contact information at the end of the um, slide deck, so you can just email us. Um, I don't know if we'll have tools for you in time, but we'll we'll do what we can. Uh, and then the, she also asked, "Who's my mentor?" Um, I, uh, I kept getting pointed to this guy in Seattle. His name is Tom Hughesby. Uh, he's, he was, he's retired now. He was a, um, he was an entrepreneur for like 20 years. Then he became a venture capitalist and he had this very strange position where he actually walked around in life with three cards from three venture capital firms, small, medium, and large, right? So a seed, a seed investor, Voyager, a, a growth investor in a late stage investment group. You know, it's $200 million fund, half a billion, half a billion dollar fund and $2 billion fund. Um, and he was basically not a general partner for any of them. He was a helper. Uh, they called it a venture partner. Uh, brilliant guy, always gives me great advice. Um, I need to see him more often. Uh, I got him, uh, when I was pointed to him, the way he became my mentor was I turned to him and offered him shares in my brand new startup that I started all by myself in exchange for being my chairman. And then he, he and I went and raised money. So I used him and his network to go find money. Uh, now I use him as a fund, fund guru. All right. I'll give you three seconds to ask one more question. Come off a of mute. Otherwise, we're going to call this one done for today. And we will see you guys next time. Thanks, John. Thanks, Lenny. Awesome yep, thank you.